Well, good evening and welcome to the Ferndale City Council meeting for Monday, August 22nd, 2016. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Barb, would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Pollico? Here. Piana? Here. Lex May? Here. Martin? Mayor Coulter? Here, thank you. Uh, Councilman Martin called just a little while ago and he is under the weather this evening, so without objection, we'll make that an excused absence since he notified us. Uh, next item of business would be the approval of the agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I support. Moved by Pollica and supported by Piana. Uh, any discussion on the agenda? All right. Barb, would you call the roll? Yes. Council Member Piana? Yes. Leeks May? Yes. Pollica? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. The agenda is adopted. Moving on now, we have a number of presentations this evening. Uh, our first one is the Beautification Awards. Uh, and I see members of the Beautification Committee here uh, this evening. Robin. Good afternoon. Robin Yelverton, 414 Nestor and the Beautification Commission. Uh, let's see if I can remember where to, how to click this. There we go, wrong one. I got it. No. There we are. All right. All right. All right, the first house that we have is from the Northwest Quadrant. This is 679 Withington. And that lovely little bungalow was built back in 1928. And is Andy Kubaki here? Does anyone know Andy? Uh, she's, I'm assuming she, since it's spelled with an I, is uh, the owner, and we just thought it was a beautiful, quaint, inviting home. The blue siding up on the rooftop, uh, gable end, you really can't tell that it's blue uh, much, but it's a beautiful touch of color for the house, and then we love the planting of the hydrangeas and the various shrubs. Uh, a lot of square lines, so to sort of counterbalance that, you've got a nicely curving sidewalk there, so we thought that was quite quite nice. The next house is 315 College Street. Uh, this is bungalow was built back in 1949 and I believe its current owner is with us, Eric Summers. Hey Eric, come on up. Come on up. Uh, <laughs> The, we thought uh, the, the beds on the home are very well manicured. The color of the maple tree that is on the left corner of the front of the house uh, almost matches the shutters perfectly. Uh, there's some, <laughs> I think he may have taken a leaf in and had him analyze the color. Um, a great little collection, but he tells us that the really pretty part of the house is in the backyard. But since we, as the Beautification Commission, are only allowed to photograph and view from the street, since we don't want to be on private property, uh, we still gave it an award. So uh, anything you want to share with us, Eric? Just thank you very much. You're the, welcome. The pressure is on when he said how well it's manicured. In it. <laughs> the the pressure on. is on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, the next house, this is in the northeast quadrant, is 1455 Orchard. And this house. You know, in Ferndale, we've got quite a collection of different styles of homes. You've got really nice, affluent looking. You've got more modest. And we have to uh, share the love with everyone. And in this case, we have a home that was built j just recently compared to a lot of the houses in Ferndale in 1972. Mm -hmm. Simple, square, little ranch style. Uh, the young lady that owns it is with us tonight, Nancy Hoffman. You like to stand up and say, hey. Um, come on, come on. When she bought this, it did not have the pergola on the front of it. It was a simple little white box with black shutters. And so we think she's done a lovely job so far. She's added color through the use of the shutters and matching furniture out front. 
Uh, she's working on those beds. The one on the, the left side, uh, you can't tell it in the photo, but actually looks very nice. Uh, and the, the front yard there is still an ongoing project. And so we just thought it was a great little eclectic garden and just found out uh, while I was talking with her this evening, Nancy's a flight attendant, so she travels a lot. So the rock garden that you see is made of rocks that she's collected from all over the world in her various travels. So I'm sure there's a lot of stories there that she could share with us uh, if we were to go view the yard. Anything you'd like to add? Can you get the rocks in, the, in, your, uh, in your luggage? <laughs> <laughs> and they're not fluid, so you don't have to do that whole bottle I thing. Can, I, can take through, but, um, I just came back from Peru. Come, speak, come up to the mic oh, just so we can I all just, hear you. Yeah. Uh, came home from Peru, and I brought some rocks back from Peru, so I'll add those to my collection. How long have you lived there? Um, since 1999. Oh, nice. Very nice. Very good. Excellent. Let's get a photo with you, Nancy. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Very nice. All right. And uh, the next house is, unfortunately, the photo truly does not do its justice. Uh, this is 726 Flowerdale. It's in the southwestern uh, quadrant. Is Lori Herb here? Hi, Lori. I know that house. Make your way <laughs> forward. <laughs> Uh, this yard is really, for, for someone like myself who loves horticulture and plants, uh, it's quite a lovely garden. And I didn't even realize how much work she had done on this. This house was built in 1946. It's in the Dales, of course, and a uh, great little bungalow. And when I was, I like to sort of search to see what else I can find about the houses that win. And I found a photo of the house, I believe, when you bought it that shows nothing but two trees, one on either side of the house, sort of framing the house, and the yard was empty. And so she bought it, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in 2011? Uh, December of 10. There you go. So in the last five years, she's removed trees and totally re-garden landscaped the entire front of the house. I, I can't vouch for the backyard. Uh, <laughs> so that is a, is a great, lovely job. She's got a, quite a collection of plants and flowers there. And uh, I think uh, you need to keep up the work, Lori. It's awesome. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Do you want to so, share any yeah, secrets or tips? Well, or Actually, I brought my mom up here with me because nice. she's done. Come up to the microphone just so we can, we can all hear you. My mom has done at least as much work as, as I have. And what's mom's name? Mom's name is Juanita. Hello, Juanita. And um, I come up with some crazy idea. Wouldn't it be neat if maybe we could, and I wake up the next morning, and mom's out in the yard going, well, you said you thought you might, so I thought I'd start on the. <laughs> she's like your little girl. And, no. Yeah, and so there we go. <laughs> and I know you can't see it in the photo, but sort of in the bottom right, there's mm -hmm. um, this uh, little evergreen bush mm -hmm. that was, besides those gigantic pine trees, the only, thing the that was only there. landscaping, and that was right up against the house. I just couldn't bear to get rid of it because I thought, well, this is all there was. I should. So I made it a little altar out in the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a lovely job with mom's house. Thank you. Really, really nice. I hope you can come by and see it. Oh, I want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, come on, mom. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very nice. All right, now we have another award, and I really didn't know who to make this out to, so it's a bit of a collection. Um, oh, it's the smart bus stop <laughs> on the corner of uh, Nine Mile and just off of Woodward. And the reason we put this in here is because I got a phone call last week from Cindy Wilcock, somewhat frantic, but, you know, she was wondering if we could be involved. Well, of course we'd love to be involved, but we can't move that fast uh, because they wanted it done. She called me on Tuesday. They wanted it done on Friday for Dream Cruise. And so uh, they went ahead and got this uh, wonderful little bus stop all fixed up. For those of you who don't know the story, 
Uh, it was started with some comments by Chris Best, who owns the Rust Belt, and then carried out, I think, through uh, the word got back to the people at SMART, and one of our uh, fellow citizens here in Ferndale, Dustin Bowerman Hagfors, works for SMART, and so they got it all approved and cleared, and so this is one of, I believe, a total of five in the city. Uh, they're removing all the advertisement from the bus stops because they're no longer going to be advertising on the stops, and so the idea was to put the art in SMART uh, for the SMART bus stops. So it's going to have artwork in it, and then the rooftop of it is actually a planted green roof, uh, which is where Chris sort of came into it, because I understand he has a little bit of experience with that. So uh, you see Dustin there painting, and Dustin actually came to our Beautification Commission meeting this past, uh, when was it, uh, the Thursday. And so we will be working with him on future projects. Uh, we just weren't able to uh, jump through the hoop as quick on this one, but we thought it deserved an award, too, as our commercial award for the month. So I don't know if anybody's here from the DDA. Barry Hicks is, and I bet he would know how there to do that. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. They, they also really helped uh, oversee and pull it all together. So uh, I think he'd be an appropriate person. Of course, a lot of the credit goes to our volunteers. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> So I have, I'm imagining that we'll probably get a lot of sedum and succulents and that sort of stuff donated uh, next year. We've already started a stockpile of our own uh, for the, the Beautification Commission, but I understand they're not going to be all identical. So right. we'll see how all of that works out. But we thought it was a great uh, step in, in Ferndale and beautification. Um, the next uh, month, we'll be doing block awards. So anyone who wants to nominate a block of the city, uh, it's not just a single home. Uh, those nominations are accepted at the DPW yard and also online on our Facebook page, Ferndale Beautification. And then finally, uh, the next nominations coming up in October are the Beautification Awards that we do every year for Halloween decor. And then, of course, the holiday lights in December. So there you are. Excellent. Robin, thank you and your group for all your hard work. Appreciate it's it. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next presentation is at uh, Ferndale Public Schools. I'm not sure I see anyone here from the public schools, however, so maybe they didn't, weren't able to make it this evening. So we'll move on, and if they come, they will put them on the agenda. Uh, so then the next presentation would be the Downtown Development Authority. Barry Hicks, bring you back up to tell us all the latest and greatest in downtown Ferndale. All right. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Um, one second, I'm just going to grab a presentation. And kind of to build a little bit on what uh, Robin was just talking about there. Um, oh, there we go. Yes, we, we did uh, just recently complete the uh, the bus stop there on uh, West Nine Mile, right next to the Rust Belt. I do believe, uh, if I remember correctly, the early conversations with uh, Chris Best, the owner of the Rust Belt there, was, I'm so glad I didn't have to go out and do this in the middle of the night and that you guys actually helped me coordinate this and get it done <laughs> legally. So um, <laughs> we're, we're very glad that happened that way, too. Um, but a, a lot of the credit, uh, I just want to thank our volunteers, um, and I believe uh, Dustin Bowerman Hagfors was already mentioned, um, and Ken Bowerman Hagfors too, Chris Bess, Francine uh, Hatcham, Derek Prattley, Madonna Van Fossen, Rick Axe, Summer and Joe Reilly, uh, Ryan Williams for doing the graphic design on there, um, and then Plant Materials uh, also came from Summer and Joe Reilly. Uh, Helene Zach, Jeannie Davis, uh, Michael Ross at Modern Tree and Landscape, and Jim Poole at Renaissance Vineyard Church. So also big thanks to the Ferndale DDA for helping get the site ready, or the DDA and the DPW for getting the site ready, and then also to SMART for letting us do this. And I definitely also want to thank Cindy Wilcock for working very hard to get this thing turned around in about two and a half weeks uh, in time for Dream Cruise uh, and coordinating all these meetings with SMART and with all our volunteers and everything. Uh, it was very challenging, and uh, she did a great job with that. 
And uh, that's what the bus stop looked like before. If anybody remembers, um, there was a lovely advertisement on the side. The contents aren't important. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, I just wanted to give credit to some of our volunteers here as they were uh, going through getting landscaping and uh, uh, putting some of the paint on there, it looks like, uh, as well as uh, I believe that's Chris putting some of the green roof on there. Um, another shot of the green roof with uh, Dustin there. He's uh, painting and uh, the finished product. So. Um, thanks to all our volunteers and everybody coming together to make that happen. Uh, it was a very successful project and we hope to transform some of the other bus stops in Ferndale. Um, also, it's probably worth noting after talking to some of the people at SMART, uh, we were the first community to approach them to do something like this. Of course so, we were. <laughs> of course we were, yes. Of course we were. <laughs> uh, but they were, they were very helpful and, and very happy to see us go forward with this, and, and they've been very supportive the entire way. Um, so thanks to everybody that was involved with that. Also, um, the Get Real movie series, uh, we just did Disney's Cars for the Dream Cruise last week. And uh, on September 15th, the third Thursday in September, we have the Princess Bride coming up. Uh, and I want to thank some of our sponsors here. Um, that would be Embrew, Ferndale Collision, Painting with a Twist, Jim Schaefer and Associates Realtors, and the Candlewick Shop uh, for sponsoring those. And then the third Thursday is continuing to October uh, when we do Fido Does Ferndale on October 20th. So more details to come on that. And that is what I have for you. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Barry. Yep. All right. Uh, our next presentation is the Ferndale Area District Library. Is there someone from the library here? Again, I'm not sure I see anyone. So we'll, we'll skip past that. And if they show up, we'll give them an opportunity to speak to us. Uh, presentation by the Ferndale Housing Commission. <laughs> and again, but she was at the last meeting, so maybe maybe yeah. that's what that was about. Uh, before we get to the last one, which is um, a presentation about the the measures that the city's taking around rodent control, I did notice that our county commissioner is here, and uh, rather than make you follow rats, um, <laughs> for rodents, thank you. Rodents, we'll give you an opportunity if you would like to take a few minutes to share what's going on at Oakland County. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a rat this evening. So <laughs> I'm trying to be on your team. So um, I do want to let you know that I went to the Oakland County Arts Authority meeting last week. We have a village for the Detroit Institute of Arts that creates an Oakland Art Authority that collects the millage for Oakland County and represents us in spending that millage. And we did an amendment. People were upset maybe about a year or two ago when there was a salary increase for the former director right after the bankruptcy. And people were very upset and we did an amendment. We said to them, you really have to be transparent in how you operate now with our public dollars. And it's been a cultural transition for the DIA. But the good news is they heard us loud and clear. And part of the millage, we did quantify that X amount of money needs to be spent in Oakland County. So we do have senior trips, buses. We have school trips where the DIA millage pays for them. We've trained 1,500 teachers on art education, and they are exceeding all of the different areas. There's program, the inside out. I know that we have the art reproductions here, really to bring art into the community. And the new director, Salvatore, this is a mission of his, and he'll go speak anywhere he's invited. So if there are different venues, I encourage you, you know, to invite him. He's really lovely. and. They also did talk about the fact that they've reorganized their administration structure, and they did decide to give more responsibility to their chief financial officer, and they are doing a big salary raise for that person, but also by the reorganization, they're saving $200,000. 
and you know in their expenses so they clearly you know where they've reassigned some duties it's okay to raise the salary and they were very open and transparent this time around so I was pleased with what I heard I just want to assure people that we are one of my learning opportunities is that I need to look at all of these different authorities clearly and closely on behalf of all of us to make sure that they're using our public dollars wisely um, we are going to have another millage present um, put before us on the Regional Transit Authority. I came from the Citizens Advisory Council meeting of the RTA before I came here, and I was informed that they are negotiating some different service contracts presently with DDOT and SMART. We are increasing service in cooperation between those organizations before we even vote on RTA. They're increasing service on weekends. There's going to be 20 hours of service now daily rather than, you know, cutting out nighttime. So I was really pleased to hear about that. I also heard a presentation at this last meeting on voting, encouraging people to register to vote. And if you are over 60 or you have a reason, please get your absentee ballot early. And if you need any type of accommodation to get to polls or do it, all you have to do is ask. There's a bunch of different volunteers that will help you, assist you so that you can exercise your right to vote. And I feel strongly about people coming out to vote for all different issues. Um, we also are in budget hearings, Oakland County, you know, we have a balanced budget, but we're in the process of, you know, doing a couple amendments and, and we will vote on that budget in September. So, any questions? No Thank questions, you. but thanks again for being at the uh, ribbon cutting of the Dream Cruise like you always are. It's great to see you there. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, now we'll move on to the final presentation, which is the rodent control measures. And who's going to lead that presentation? You know what? I get the joy. You get the, I do. You get the joy. <laughs> That's why you make the big bucks, Sarah, from 20 years in government. And I'm, uh, my pinnacle is this. <laughs> Hang on, we're queuing it up really yeah. quick, and I'll. But let me let me tee it up because in all seriousness, um, we know that we have rodents in this town like we have rodents in in all the all the cities around here, and I don't know that it's always clear the steps that the city has taken to address this. We haven't always communicated it, but we do have a, a, a plan in place to address this, and so this is a beginning of our attempt to make residents aware of some of the things that we're currently doing and will be doing. Uh, to address the rodents in Ferndale. Um, first thing is we prefer to call them rodents. It sounds cuter than rats, but we know it is what it is. So I want to talk a little bit about not only some of the measures that the city has done, but also um, what a unique situ or what a unique problem that this is. Not unique to us, um, but a unique problem in general. And it's definitely in urban areas much more much more prevalent than in maybe the in more of the suburb areas and it just it's part of the nature but it doesn't have to be something that we have to um, ignore and just say it is what it is there's things and measures that we can take they'll never go away but we want to try to decrease the amount so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like I think that it's important to note that this is one of the most unique um, enforcement issues or issues within a community because it's one of the very few that it's actually a huge partnership the city can't do it alone and it's, it's really in fact we have kind of a six-point system almost all together but in general though um, this is actually one of the least amount of things that we as a city um, workers can actually help address this is a huge prevention issue and a habit issue among residents and we're going to talk a little bit about that but we will talk about some of the controls that we can put in place so Again, that I kind of mentioned before, this is not a unique situation to Ferndale. Um, it is a, a definitely along Woodward, and Michigan is, is, a, is a huge issue. A lot of the communities, I think Royal Oak just launched a campaign last year on rat control, or rodent control as well. So it's not unique, but again, it's not about whether or not everybody else is having the same problem. It's about how is Ferndale trying to address that. And again, we're going to go over all of those key uh, factors as we go through here. 
Um, as I mentioned before, there is not one single solution that addresses the rodent population. It actually is a huge partnership and it has many, many factors, again, which makes it very complex. So we'll be talking about that as we move forward. So I want to talk a little bit about what we've done to clean up our own house. One of the things that we really try to focus on is what do we need to do within our own, what, what the city controls, what are we doing to control our and, and participate in our part. Some of the key things that we have done uh, over the last few years is really addressing our own um, trash compactors and receptacles. Uh, the DPW department has really cracked down on the trash compactors and making sure that businesses are following the rules and putting the trash inside. Again, we're not perfect, but the control measures that we put in place are much better than they used to be a few years ago. We try to keep them as clean as possible and really push making sure that garbage goes inside the trash compactor and not on the outside. The other thing that we have done is addressed all of our, um, our own garbage cans and trying to find a a measures that we put in place um, to address the rats getting into just the, 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 public, um, the, the public garbage cans. And I know, again, the DPW team has really worked really hard to come up with a way to try to prevent them from getting in there. And I think we found a, a decent solution to try to uh, keep the rats away from food. And, when we talk about what prevention is, there's a lot of things that we'll talk about of what actually uh, leads, a, what, what there is to make a good home for a rodent and what we want to avoid. And one of them is definitely that food source. The other thing that uh, DPW has really been focusing on is along 8 Mile. We actually were able to take over 8 Mile. We contract with the state, which has really helped us be able to be more proactive um, and, again, trying to prevent any more of the rodents from coming in our community is again about prevention. So we, we focused on changing some of the landscaping, again the garbage, all of that. Again we have some challenges there. We have a lot of the homeless that live there and a lot of food is, is dropped off to them and a lot of times that's left in the garbage. So it's not a perfect process but we are, our DBW has been really, really um, persistent in making sure that that area remains clean and addressing any of the contributors to the rat population to try to avoid them coming even further into Ferndale. Um, we've actually been meeting regularly as a team to start to ad address um, what is going on, what are patterns, and that kind of thing. So we meet actually as a city team with code enforcement, DPW, um, our communications department, the city manager's office. It might, might seem a little weird that the city manager is actually giving this presentation, but we wanted to make sure that people understood that the city is taking this very seriously and that we actually have working as a team to address the, the many factors that are contributing to this issue. And we've actually just recently, um, God bless him, <laughs> our recent um, inspector that we hired has wanted to become an expert and has really been pushing his knowledge and doing a lot of research to become what we consider an expert and a specialist on our team to really be able to keep looking at best practices and take a look at what that rodent population is looking is what's happening and how we can prevent it and lower that number. So we're really pleased that they've taken on um, that, that role as well, which needed to be done. So now that we know what the city has been doing, it's it's more uh, some of the changes that we're making, but what role that we all play is, part, is that partnership. And I can't reiterate enough of how important that this particular issue is a partnership. It's unlike any other issue <laughs> that usually, you know, you call up City Hall and we need you to take care of this and, and that kind of thing. This is one that it actually becomes a very personal endeavor for our residents and is really important to understand about that partnership. So let's talk a little bit more about um, what roles that we all play, and, and again, this will talk a little bit more about what the city is doing too. Code enforcement is, is really important to talk about. I would say in the past, we've been a little more loving with our code enforcement, and now we kind of equate it to our, our residents are turning into teenagers and might be a little more firm, if you will. <laughs> and so we started taking a look at what tools as it relates to code enforcement do we need to really put in operation as it relates to um, helping the prevention of, ex of the rodent population from getting larger and actually doing, making a reduction. And so what we have really done is taken a look at um, what is causing the, there's a difference in resident, the residential areas and possibly you know, where all the restaurants are and things of that nature. So as you go through here, as we go through this, our common theme will be that not every neighborhood is going to have the same rodent issue and there will be different contributors but overall, it's all kind of the same, the same, uh, the same issues that are happening. So we are looking at strength, strengthening our code enforcement in both the residential and business districts, which means that we're going to be 
a little more, we are going to be a lot more firm than we have been in really helping people understand why it's so important that they address some of these issues. Um, staff is going to be um, actually bringing to council in the next a couple of meetings. We've been looking at um, what are some of our ordinances that could be inhibiting us from being a little firmer in our um, in our code enforcement. And one of the things that is is again a huge you'll hear common theme: food source is a huge problem for rodent control. One of the things that we found was that our ordinance it was conflicting a little bit and, and didn't quite support um, having requiring garbages, garbage cans with lids. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to be taking a look at is ensuring that we don't have loose garbage in particular in, in, in any of our neighborhoods and in our business districts. So we're going to have to take a look at what that looks like and what the implementation, what the impl, impl, what's the word? Implications. Thank you, implications <laughs> for that. So that's one thing that we'll be revisiting. I'm looking, uh, working right now with our attorney to take a look what that will look like and bring that forward to city council. The other thing is with garbage, um, the city is actually going to be working with the downtown business to help them understand and address their dumpster management. That seems to be a significant issue, dumpsters overflowing, that kind of thing, uh, and making sure that not only are, is garbage, is the dumpsters closed, but making sure that they're not overflowing and that they, that they have the appropriate amount of pickups to make sure that that garbage stays inside. Again, I can't reiterate enough how important removing a food source from the rodent population is critical in prevention. Resident involvement. Um, one of the key components to this is your personal responsibility as a resident to addressing um, some of the, uh, many of the rodent issues. And we're going to talk a little bit at the next slide about the prevention. Um, it's, it's key to really take a look at your yard and assess, are you contributing to that issue? You know, and also, what does that look like in your neighborhood? And we have, as part of that, um, using um, Adam Loomis as our inspector who's taken this on as his personal mantra of trying to become that expert and being that support system for residents and neighborhoods to understand what is going on. He's gonna, he would be able to come out and assess your yard and offer you some direction on what you can do to clean some things up as well as if you have a neighborhood group or a neighborhood that wants to join together and take a look at what, what those issues are. And we're gonna talk about that in the next slide. But again, it's, it's very much as, just as important for each resident to, to take a look at prevention measures as it is for the city. So some of the key prevention, um, and it's important, I'm gonna back up for just a second too, as well as that baiting and, and poisoning is the last option you wanna make. And you, if we don't prevent, then the baiting is almost really not helpful because they're just keep harboring and they keep getting food and it just keeps it they they um they just populate so, so quickly that prevention is actually the most important step you can take um one of the things is that you know once you start seeing those rodents in your yard is to pay attention and immediately is a sign for you to take a look at what's going on in your own yard uh, landscaping and lawn maintenance is really important. We have um, updated on our website, we have a new brochure that, we've, um, that we have just made as well as more information that really talks about what are some landscaping um, concerns that you might want to be aware of with alternatives. Um, they really low to the ground shrubbery and things of that nature. They don't, they want to find, not only do they want to find food, but they want to find a place to be warm and to be out of uh, the eye of the public. So anything that they can hide in, especially that low landscaping can be an issue, but our brochure talks in more detail about what, what are better options. A huge component is, again, storing your garbage in containers that have a lid. If they can't smell it and they can't see it, they don't want to get in there, but they can choose through rubber. I mean, it's, that's difficult, but if you're keeping them out from other prevention measures, then just covering up in, in, in a sealed container is very helpful in keeping them away and out of your yard. A lot of people don't know this, but a huge component is, is your animal waste. They love animal waste, just as disgusting as the rat is. <laughs> and so people need to be very diligent about cleaning up um, your animal waste that you have in your backyard. Um, again, this is another thing too, is when you stack up pieces of wood or you have piles of brush or anything like that, composting is, is just a breeding ground. Again, it, that, that place for what we call, what we term harborage is very critical and maintaining that. I was telling somebody the other day that um, we, are, we are doing um, some 
work on my own house and uh, we had put up we had a wood pile temporarily while my husband was was cleaning things up within a day my dogs were at that wood pile so quick because there was animals had already within 24 hours had already found a home in that wood pile that is so so important is to make sure that you keep all piles off the ground um, and you can have those as long as they're not on the ground you have to have them lifted again they're looking for a safe haven um, bird feeding and landscaping so bird feeding is it's a very complicated issue because people love their birds and we understand that but we do have in their brochure I believe Kara correct me if I'm wrong there are different bird feeders though that help prevent the bird feed or the the feed coming onto the ground and that's what you don't want to do is have that um, the bird seed and all of that stuff on your ground because again they can that's what they're looking for is food so really taking a look if you're if you have if you want a bird feeder making sure that it keeps it off away from the ground um, the other prevention measure again as we had talked about is that we do have staff on hand to come in and do an assessment and help you understand where some of the areas are and give you suggestions if you feel that that you want that help we can provide that support for you um, we have that as well on our website for your information so the, the prevention as you can see has got the longest list because that's the most critical and important part elimination is one of the things that we talked about is that again we talked a little bit about baiting and sometimes you do have to do that and we you, it's this you got to get rid of them somehow we, we understand that and respect that but again without the preventative measures the, the baiting is almost a mute point if you will and a, a mute point and we have to be careful with that because if you don't bait correctly then you can have other animals that die so we actually not too long ago had a, an area that didn't bait appropriately and we lost a bunch of squirrels and birds and things of that nature so it's critical for uh, residents who want to bait and it's completely acceptable um, we encourage you to use a reputable pest control company but you can also buy the stuff at Home Depot or Lowe's but just make sure you follow the directions and make sure that there's very specific directions on how you bait to avoid having your own animals or your cats or squirrels or bunnies get in, in to get into that so we do recognize that people that our residents are really sensitive to the other animals and that's why you'll notice in all of our information we talk more about prevention because that's actually the most critical believe it or not but that we do recognize absolutely that baiting will need to take place but to do it as the most responsible and the most humane way as possible and a lot of those companies <clears throat> will be able to help you walk through a safer measure of baiting I think as you can see this is really an education component a lot of a lot of residents just don't understand how important that it is that it's a personal choice and a decision to to address your yard it's a part the city plays a part in it and making sure we're enforcing but really understanding how important it is um, when you talk to a code enforcement officer they they get very passionate about you know their frustration and what they're seeing and a lot of tips so we're trying to put as much as we can to help you understand what role and what we need to do to support the rodent control um, especially with winter coming up a couple of tips that we want to talk about really quick is that with winter coming up they're gonna want to find a warm place to stay so making sure that as you clean up your yard and you winterize it if you will get all that stuff off the floor try to put it in or off the ground try to get in your garage the less you have in your backyard the very the much there's a much less chance of them being able to what we call harbor and that's what's really important so it just to, to kind of reiterate what what we can do to support you in understanding how you can help with rodent control is on yeah. our website we do have a brochure all of our code enforcement officers or inspectors actually all of our inspectors including all of our rental inspectors uh, building inspectors will have brochures to offer as they're going to as they see issues because they know what it looks like they're going to provide that information to residents but it's available online um, we also are, are we're in the middle of creating one for businesses too right Kara I think yeah we are so one specifically to business especially in the downtown district again every area has a little bit different we can do workshops with you if you have a neighborhood group or you just have a, a, a block that you want to work together we can bring somebody in to have a conversation with you and help you with all of that and then we do again our inspectors not only the one that is becoming a specialist but all of our inspectors have a lot of information and our wealth of knowledge that we want to help you um, address 
um, the, the rodent population within your neighborhood. So that is uh, pretty much rodents in a nutshell. I do, this is going to go on our website as well. <laughs> Uh, Adam Loomis is the inspector that I've been talking about. His direct dial is right on there. Um, and I think we have his email address. If not, we'll make sure that that is on there as well. I can't quite see. Yep, but we are absolutely there to help anybody who needs it, um, who wants um, assistance, assessments, anything that you need, we're there to help you. Any questions from council? So is there questions of council? And then if there's anyone in the audience that has any questions, I'll give you an opportunity after mm -hmm. council has a chance as well. So um, that, I may yeah. not have all the answers, heads up, but right, I yep, to. Yep. <laughs> um, Fair enough. I was wondering if this presentation was going to be available on our website too. She, yeah. She said yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Other questions? Um, you provide a lot of information about outside property, um, and you did bring up the, uh, the idea of keeping things in garages, but is are garages also an issue, or is there has there been issues with, you know, rats, you know, coming out or, or you mm -hmm. know, I think housing in people's garages? In talking to code in, or in the inspectors, I keep calling them inspectors, that a lot of it is making sure that all of your holes are filled. If you're building anything new to have a rat wall, if you don't have one and you have a rat problem, to be able to put one in. So, I mean, obviously a lot of people have older garages, but really double checking where your holes are and making sure everything is plugged is key to that. And if you have more, if you think that your garage is contributing to that, definitely give um, us a call and we can come out and do that assessment for you. I would assume that applies for like under porches and yep, absolutely. decks. Mm -hmm. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, one of talking to one of our other inspectors, he had mentioned that actually, when you do a deck, when they can, and they do inspections, they actually ask that you not put anything around it on the bottom. You want it open because again, it keeps them. It's windy, it's cold, and they're always looking for a place to be warm. So the more open all of that is, the less chance they have that they would want to harbor. Apparently, I know more than I thought I did. <laughs> Any questions? other questions from council? I guess a couple for me. First, a comment, and that is um, on the code enforcement. It is so difficult because um, everyone has an opinion about code enforcement, but they're either one or the other. It's either too lenient, and that's if it's somebody on your block that you think needs to be cracked down on, or it's too harsh, and that's probably because it was you uh, that got contacted <laughs> by the city. We rarely strike the exact balance that residents Fine. So I know that is a challenge, but I think it is important, and I like, you know, I, the way you phrase it is, is, is good. You know, we've gone from sort of being very kind and educational. Uh, we do need to begin to be firmer uh, with residents uh, uh, about what's expected, because as the problem continues, um, and, and knowing that that's going to cause some people to think that we're being too harsh now and we'll get those reactions, but I think we're just going to have to gird ourselves for that. So that's just a comment. Uh, a question, a couple of just minor questions. You talked about uh, working with the downtown business owners because it strikes me that the downtown issues are a little different than the, the neighborhood issues uh, because of the restaurants and sure. the, the kinds of things. Um, I was just struck, you said the city will work with downtown businesses, but um, are we or should we be involving our, the great folks at the DDA to help us with that? They're, they're good at communicating with them. They have those relationships. I didn't notice them on your, your task force either, but, but it's such a uniquely different problem downtown. Yeah, we, we will have, um, before we do any outreach. We Barry, will, we, we want to get you involved in rats, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, um, that, I'm sorry, that was implied. But yeah, we will work with the DDA in yeah. education. For the, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Awesome. They're on there, yeah. Um, and then I guess, and maybe there's not an answer to this, but how do we know if we're succeeding? How do you, how is this measured? Because anecdotally, everybody thinks there's lots of rats always, but but that's not always true. Is it is yes. it measurable? And if so, how do we do that? Um, yes, uh, I can't give you the details because I, I would need to sit down with Adam. But he okay. is actually there is a a measure that you can take, and he's working through right now finding out the metrics for that. And okay. believe it or not, and I know this just sounds like I'm trying to the issue but even the CD the CDC says that it becomes what's called a tolerance issue <laughs> how tolerable can it be because they are never going to go away but what we can do is measure 
And unfortunately, we probably won't see results right away. It'll take about eight months before you can pre and post. So once Adam and the uh, CED team has that kind of understood what those metrics will look like, I'll make sure to report back on what we're measuring and how do we, how are we looking at, are we successful? So we're trying to kind of uh, really wrap up, ramp up right now so that we can try to educate as much on protecting um, our properties for the winter because that's when spring hits. The, the, the more that we can get some of those measures controlled now, that hopefully some of that population will die off in the winter. But it, okay. there is a measurable outcome, and we just have to, we're looking into what that looks like and what that means. Good. All right. To the chair, yeah. I have a follow-up question, um, a couple. Um, can you talk a little bit about apartment complexes who also have dumpsters and how that fits in? Um, not necessarily a downtown issue or not a single family homeowner issue, but definitely is impacting neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It would be, obviously, they may have a dumpster situation, so that would be addressed through enforcement as well in a different manner than the loose garbage that we're talking about. So that will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Fortunately, our inspectors are there on a regular basis doing rental inspections, so we actually have been educating our rentals a lot longer than we have our own residents. So that will be handled appropriately, whether they have a dumpster or loose trash as well. Um, and I know one issue I've heard from residents um, is also is vacant housing. Um, so um, I know that is a specific um, issue, sort of a subset issue of this taking care of rodents. And I know you and I have talked about privately Correct. of addressing um, our vacant housing or our housing ordinance that deals with vacant housing. But I think um, this problem with rodent control is related. Mm -hmm. If, like I said, every neighborhood might have a different reason for or different contributors, and one of them could be blight. And as part of this, we're also looking at the bigger issues of um, maybe some of the houses that have been a blighted problem for quite some time that are more than just a rat problem. It could be just like a vac vacant blighted property. I also want to note one of the things that we have done and we're enforcing right now is that any time a house gets or any kind of time a building gets demoed, we require 30 days of abatement. <coughs> So that makes sure that there are baits set and traps so that we can make sure that it is rodent free before the demo comes down. We've actually been having a couple people comment they're getting concerned about the two school buildings that could be coming down in the next year. But we've actually are readjusting our permit process as it relates to demo to include that rodent control measure as well. So we're that and hopefully we actually did that with Ferndale House as they were they, they did a pre bait, if you will, an assessment on the rodents before it got demoed. And my final question um, is related to the, the last um, community education meeting or city education meeting. Um, and there really is real concern about environmentally and, and, and humane ways um, of um, trapping and killing the rodents as well as disposal. Um, so I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about, um, there's a, a somewhat, there's a group that's interested in putting up owl houses and I was wondering how this relates to um, this 4.5 sure. point program that you have here. Again, I think we focus more on the prevention measures as it relates to actually, you know, removing the rats, if you will, or rodents. We would encourage people to call a pest control and maybe other people will find, I think, the, the owl houses as well as more humane ways of dealing with, with mm -hmm. that rodent population. There's, we, we support the owl houses. We recognize that's definitely a component of that, um, so it really just depends on how you as a homeowner want to manage that process. Okay. One other thought that I had. Um, I'm open to you guys coming to us with perhaps some ordinance modification that requires a, uh, a trash can with a lid. I'm also sensitive to the fact that we have a, a community with a lot of range of incomes and, and that could be a financial hardship so sure. for folks, so I hope that, and I. I'm guessing that you will sort of when you put that recommendation together, we might need some sort of a income hardship mm -hmm. discount or okay. something just um, to make sure that it's not uh, too much of a financial burden on folks. Okay, well, you just took my comment. Oh, so I'm, I'm done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. All right. Anything else from council? Is there anyone from the the public that has a a comment or concern about rodents that they would like to share with us as we work through this? All right. Well, thank you, April. That was very helpful and educational, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, all right. Our next item of business would be um, we have a couple of public hearings that we need to conduct this evening, and Justin from our Community and Economic Development uh, Department will 
conduct those, the first being a special land use application for 1725 Pinecrest Drive. Good yes. evening. Good evening. Um, as the mayor stated, we did recently have a uh, special land use application for a, the reuse of an existing home, um, primarily as a resident, but also as an accessory use for um, the home of Jewish Ferndale. Um, within the zoning ordinance, uh, obviously in our in one single family residential district, that use is permitted. Um, however, with um, any type of um, accessory use as a religious community center um, requires special land use, which is why we're having the public hearing. Um, and just for clarification purposes, accessory uses for places of worship in our ordinance includes living quarters uh, for the ministry, a uh, place of re religious education classes, and things of that nature. Um, so the application is a proposal for primarily use um, for um, the applicant to, and his family to live there primarily, and then accessory would be for um, small classes um, and living quarters, as I mentioned. Um, so the application came in earlier this summer. We had a um, public hearing at the Planning Commission at the July 20th meeting. Um, the meeting was noticed properly, um, and residents came out, um, had some general concerns about parking, building capacity, noise levels, things like that. Um, the applicant clarified a lot of those items um, and also is proposing some additions to the site, including a new bike rack. Um, the site is actually pretty unique in that it was previously a dentist office for many years um, and has its own surface parking lot on site. Um, the parking requirements based in the ordinance for single family homes and for um, religious institutions of religious worship um, has enough parking on site for that, but the uh, applicant also secured a um, parking agreement with the Renaissance Vineyard Church, which is just across Nine Mile there. Um, so in that end, the um, Planning Commission approved the site plan, recommended approval of the special land use. Um, and since that time, um, the Planning Commission offered up some conditions related to the site plan. Um, staff's been working with the applicant to have those addressed, and those will be um, part of the final administrative site plan approval. But. Um, other than that, staff's also recommending um, approval of the special land use permit, um, and I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Great. And so before I open it up to the public hearing, I know I, I see the good rabbi here. Do you want to just sort of briefly uh, come on up and describe what you're doing there? Um, and then we'll open it up to the public for any comments that they have, and then we'll have council. Good to see you again, sir. Thank you for having us. Um, our idea is we recognize that there is a growing Jewish population in Ferndale whose needs are not being met. We've been working for close to a year and a half now with the Jewish population starting in December of 2014 and the working with people in houses and various establishments in the downtown whenever we needed to do anything and became clear very quickly the, the popular, popularity of our, our getting togethers, our groups that we needed something which would accommodate um, a larger space and uh, finding this house, uh, this former dentist's office has proved to be um, the perfect site for all of these various things. Our, our goal with it, one of the things we wanted to attract is that this site be, if not the most, but one of the most green facilities in, the, in Ferndale. We've, uh, come contract with an uh, organization in Ohio that provides solar paneling for, for uh, churches and schools. We're looking to, uh, to make the, the, the grounds around to be environmentally uh, sound and uh, to do all types of things to increase the greenness of the property and that it should be a showcase piece for the city of Ferndale. That's, that's basically our idea. Excellent. Thank you, Rabbi. So at this point, I will open up the public hearing. And is there anyone from the public that would like to address council on this special land use permit? No. All right. So I, I oh. have a question. We, we live, um, to come, if you could come up to the microphone just so that we can all hear you and the folks at home can hear you as well, that'd be great. And give us your name, uh, if you don't mind. So my name's John Mazza, and we own a home on Pinecrest also just across the street. Unfortunately, when the last hearing happened, we were out of the country, so we were 
unable to participate. I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, what what level of traffic is going to be going in and out of that house? Um, it seems like it's already a rather busy area with some of the stores that are just north of the uh, of, of that property and. Uh, we're concerned about the the amount of traffic, you know, the number of people going in and out, and uh, just controlling things a little bit. Yep. So I and have a question about. I think that. I'll ask Justin to address that because I know parking and vehicular traffic was a concern at this planning commission. So could you sort of address what was discussed there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the further, uh, I mean, in discussions with the rabbi, you know, his, his intent has always been to have small classes. Um, so the planning commission requested having the fire marshal actually, which is a normal um, process that the fire marshal does, usually later in the building process, but um, have him go and assess, you know, realistically by building and fire code how many people could actually be in this facility. Um, and in his recommendation, 32 would be the maximum. Um, in discussions with the uh, rabbi, you know, that 32 would be at a, on a very minimal um, large, I mean, that would be a, the largest, obviously, and that would not be a normal happenstance. Um, but aside from that, it, there would be, um, it would be, re if, if they went much, went much, if he allowed for much more capacity than that, um, it would require fire suppression, which the rabbi has no interest in doing either, so. And did that prompt the discussion with the additional parking across nine miles? Are you um, the parking was kind of, a, the additional parking was always kind of part of the discussion, part of the plan. Okay. 32 cars is an awful lot of cars to add to that area. And, and there's only 16 spaces on, on site, so that's why the shared parking agreement is in place. And then also um, there's an expected a lot of amount of bike, bike traffic with the addition of the bike rack and then people walking as well. The rabbi is installing a new walkway from the sidewalk to, for, for ADA purposes to get to the building as well. So, and then I would have one other question. No, okay. no parking on Pinecrest, no. yeah. One other question would be, so if this becomes a religious site, then is it excluded from taxes? Uh, probably so. I believe so. Right. But typically that is... Yep. How, what religious institutions would do? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I, I guess I still have some concerns about the whole thing, but it sounds like it's too far down the road to really impact anything. Well, that's why we're here for the public hearing, sir. Yeah. So what hours would, would people be coming and going? Is that would the hours address at the Planning Commission, Justin? Yeah, I believe the final hours were... Typical normal evening hours, um, 10 o'clock being the latest, um, and that, that would be for certain events. Um, but also the, as the rabbi had mentioned, he will be living there. So it's a sort of a situation where he, you know, is, doesn't want to have his family up, you know, all hours of the night, seven days a week. So it's kind of limited there as well. But um, but the other, with along with hours, uh, the question that came up was noise levels at the planning commission. Um, and, you know, this facility, just like any other, would be um, bound to the noise noise ordinance that we have here in the city. So who monitors that? Um, the police department. Um, you know, they take any complaints if there's, if there is, uh, if there is a complaint of, you know, loud noise and things like that, they do have a, you know, meter that reads decibels and it's, I forget what the actual range is of what's permissible, but it's bound by certain um, hours and that decibel level. Um, is it possible, um, Justin, this is for my education and perhaps for his, his mm -hmm. and other residents' benefit, but so a lot of uh, negotiation happened with the Planning Commission, a lot of restrictions and these sort of things mm -hmm. were put into place. Is that a, a public document that, that folks can see so that they know when 
uh, uh, not just here, but in any uh, property is out of compliance with their special land use permit, and they can they know that that would be a logical time to call the police or the, you know, um, the city. Um, the, no the noise ordinance is available the on the city's website, for sure. But I mean, I'm talking about the particular um, conditions. restrictions and conditions that he has agreed to. Yes. Are, are those available so that residents understand what they are and know when they may be violated? Yes. Um, so in this, as far as even at this meeting, um, but after the Planning Commission meeting, minutes are recorded and approved at the following meeting. So all of the minutes, all the conditions that were approved will be, would be, are always posted on the city's website following month once the Planning Commission approves those minutes. Gotcha. Um, but before the meeting, any conditions that are included in the packet prior to the meeting, those are – everything that was discussed at the meeting prior to the meeting was uh, – is on the city's website as well. So always at ferndalemi.gov, agendas and minutes is the button at the end, bottom of the page, and anyone can see what's on the upcoming agenda and anything that was sent to the Planning Commission in advance. So, if so, yeah, come on up. And that's a 32 community sound. Incredibly excessive, 32 people. Um, a dentist office would be, I don't think he works on 32 people. That is a concern of mine because that area isn't that big. I couldn't imagine 32 as, you know, is there a discussion point of, of limiting that to a much smaller number than 32? Because if you park across to a different parking lot, I don't think that that's an appropriate thing for the space that's allotted. 32, the building that we're familiar with, I can't believe the fire marshal would approve 32 people being in there as a safety issue. Well, he inspected the property, and that's, I don't know how he, he comes right. up there with There would his, be, I mean, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the, there would be, as, as part of the process, I mean, this was just a cursory review walkthrough. Um, once the building plan, once if this plan was approved, building plans would be submitted, and that's when he would truly go out and make a, a final assessment. Um, but you know, as part of this special land use process, you know, that's an option to limit capacity and things like that um, from from this board or from this from council's perspective. But um, yeah, I mean, his his review of the property, 32, um, you know, was based on the current configuration um, and. That configuration could be smaller as well, based on some of the improvements um, that the rabbi had spoke about. So, 32 would be the max. I, so, I'm, just so I understand your concern, is your concern about having actually 32 people in the facility, or the the parking and other stuff? I think the stuff? noise, the noise and the parking associated with it is, it, it's there's going to be a lot of it. There'll be a lot of traffic. 32 mm -hmm. people, I think, is a lot. It is a residential area. <clears throat> um, Based on the previous business, a dentist wouldn't have that quantity, and so it would never have been our expectation when we purchased the house that we would have that type of traffic right there. I, I know, understand we're really close to Nine Mile, and there is quite a bit, but that is also, believe it or not, it's just far enough away that that isn't, and you have families there. And so I guess with the traffic and the hours of operation that could be potential for a religious um, site, I, I think I read actually originally it was 24-7. I can, the, the rabbi can speak on specific 24-7, but, I mean, in all the previous conversations, it had been that the only 24-7 piece would be that it, he and his wife would be living there because um, that's their primary residence. That's the primary um, use. Okay. If I may. Yes. Now, I'm pretty sure that at that, that particular address, there's already been events hosted there. So was that an issue for anyone because there have been events there already. Well, we own the house and my nephew and his small child and his wife live in the house and that's part of our concern is they've got children and, and um, so we don't actually live in the house but okay. we're concerned about what's coming and also what it's going to do to property values in the area. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I guess we, we're going to agree to disagree with um, the property values um, with that type of traffic in a residential area and the concern of that and the safety ha ha habit of it, even though there is discussion that it is something that's limited to hours, a, re a religious organization, I believe, does have full access 24-7. So, so why would there already be events happening if this hasn't been approved? 
Well, this was, um, there were events, and I'm sure the rabbi can speak to it, but I'm pretty sure that there was um, get-togethers. I mean, they're going to be living there, so there was... Well, that's fine. Right. But that's yeah. fine. And it might have been easily connected. 30 people at that, that time. It's just, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, I understand the parking concerns, but with um, stating that there can be, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's a pretty long driveway, so I'm thinking... How many cars did you say could fit in that driveway? 16. 16. And then um, with the, the collaboration with Renaissance Vineyard, there's plenty of parking there and just... Mm -hmm. I know, but you're taking another property to subsidize allowing even more people to be at that facility. And I would beg to differ that 16 could fit normally. There may be 16 that you could fit in there, mm -hmm. but 16 normally, I don't know if I necessarily agree. I haven't measure things out or I'm not going to trespass on somebody's property but everyone in residence have parties but nobody has parties or classes every day or even multiple times um, a week you know a, a par neighbor having a party with you know over 32 people in the backyard you know for a birthday celebration is probably pretty normal in a residential but not something that you continuously have and are burdened with right across the street. We bought it as an investment property and I feel that this is something that's a little bit of a disappointment for us because we didn't expect something like that with that type of traffic. Thank you. And, and I think the other conversation that came up at the Planning Commission is that if this property was not one parcel away from West Nine Mile, maybe it wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't normally be considered for this use. That's why we have special land use as part of the, the process for R1 districts and for institutions of religious worship. Um, but it sort of acts as a transition to the rest of the neighborhood. If it were further down the block, I don't think this would be permissible. Um, because it's not desirable. And I think if it didn't already have a surface parking lot um, there, then that would also be another reason, um, you know, that it, it wouldn't be considered if it were further down the block. Um, but I think that the rabbi has, in his application, he mentioned it as well, but his... Um, he has a great desire to be part of the community and be a real, really good neighbor. So I think you know the concerns I, about noise and hours and things like that are definitely something to consider. But I think that um, he has a very strong interest in being a good neighbor and being a part of the community. So if there were, you know, instances of noise or things like that that he were cited or anything like that, I, he'd quickly remedy remedy those um, issues as well. Through the chair, I have a couple questions. Um, this is still oh. the public hearing, so we're going to allow the public to speak now, and then we will have opportunity. So come on up, ma'am, and give us your, your name and uh, any questions or concerns that you have. I don't have any concerns. Okay. Um, I'm Helen Lombardo. I live across the street from uh, the facility. And my conversation is there's already four churches in the area. There's not a real issue. There's, if you want to complain about noise and all that other stuff, the people going up and down Pinecrest with radios blaring and all hours of the night and the people going through the Taco Bell, that could be a real issue. This, I don't think, is going to be an issue at all. I think that you've got people going to church. They are going to be less likely to disrupt a neighborhood. And I would like to support what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to address council on this special land use? Uh, all right, Rabbi. There, there was a discussion since the front lawn is massive, it's 60 feet deep by about 50 feet wide, of turning the space into a meditative garden taking out the grass, doing it. My wife and I are not into grass, we're into like mow low, no mow, having benches, having a place of solitude where people can sit and contemplate. And it was eight o'clock at night when we were standing on the front lawn and the, the noise generated from the traffic coming across Nine Mile and Pinecrest totally and completely ruled out any type of an idea of having a meditative garden because all you'd be meditating about is how loud the traffic was. So as far as the noise that is going to be generated by the property and the goings of ins and outs, the number 32 is going to be just on very rare occasions. 
we're looking at a space which is going to have eight, ten people at any given time, which is very much equal to what was there. The dentist put in a parking lot which holds 18 spaces, understanding that he must have needed those 18 spaces or he would not have put them in. I don't foresee or envision the parking lot being full on a regular basis and the egress and access to coming out onto, the, onto Pinecrest, not creating any sort of uh, traffic jam, impeding with traffic flow. And as uh, Mr. Lyons pointed out, we're coming to augment the neighborhood. And I do sincerely believe that the presence of Jewish Ferndale will have a major positive effect on the properties, as I know that since I bought this house in May, even before we started even thinking that many, many Jewish families have now purchased houses in Ferndale and are looking forward to us being there. All right. Seeing no other people from the public, I will close the public uh, hearing portion and I will now open it up to council for comments and questions. Um, through the chair? Yes. Um, I couldn't um, ascertain from the write-up is how many square feet are, is this house? What's this? 3,700 total. 3,700 3, square foot. Um, and can, uh, maybe this is a question for Dan uh, Chris, our lawyer, um, but in the first paragraph of the uh, request for council action, it says, um, accessory uses and places of worship in the city ordinance includes rectories, living quarters, and ministry, religious education classes, daycare and playground, religious <coughs> office space, and other similar activities. Um, if we approve this tonight, are we also allowing um, this uh, places of worship to also put in a daycare or a playground down the road? If that is something they wanted to do after we approve this, is that something that they could put in? Uh, through the chair, uh, no, but for purposes of clarity, uh, it, that could be in council <coughs> uh, in any type of motion that you were to entertain, uh, that it is uh, as the uh, presentation is set forth, it's uh, the, the principal use remains uh, residential. It is an accessory use for an institution of, of, of public uh, worship purposes. And to the extent that there is uh, other uses, uh, while there are certain RELUPA issues that would need to be considered by uh, council, which, which go to federal issues regarding uh, institutions of religious uh, worship, the clarity in the motion limiting it to the institution of religious worship sets forth the, the city's position on that issue. Should there be some future speculative additional use that the uh, rabbi were to contemplate, at least the, the city would be on record as it relates to the scope that it intended for, for the uh, accessory use. <coughs> Dan, you're usually very clear, but you lost me. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Can he open a daycare? <laughs> Through the chair, the, the problem associated with that issue is if, he, if, if one were to argue that the daycare was for uh, uh, children of his uh, uh, members while they were having some type of class, there would be an argument associated that under federal law that he, that it, that the city should not inhibit that right. use under RELUPA. So it would be speculative for me to say that it's impossible. What I'm trying to suggest is that the should council wish to uh, approve the special land use, it could provide additional clarity as it relates to the scope of the accessory use it envisions, which is an institution of religious worship. The, the applicant, that as it relates to his proposed uses, I mean, it identifies a couple of the uses that he proposes, an area for uh, uh, Jewish Ferndale, but it, it doesn't go into a laundry list of what those uses might consist of. Right. And what's the line between a backyard play area for a residential and a playground for a business that would qualify as a daycare? Is that a jungle gym? of some sort of size? I mean, like, that, I don't know what the difference would be if it's a residential use. 
as a place of worship. It gets some sticky. It's sticky there, right? So, I, in answering, asking my question, and your answer, I had more questions, which provide no clarity. Could maybe <laughs> could I ask the rabbi a question? I can imagine, and I guess my assumption was, if you're doing a class and you have ten people, and some of them bring a couple of kids, you might have another place where the kids could be. Uh, uh, facilitated, uh, but that your general idea wasn't to make it a, a daycare center for Jewish families that would be on a regular basis. At, at, so, would you be would you have an objection to us clarifying that so that it couldn't become a, a full blown daycare center, which it does seem to imply in this language that that would be a, possible. A drop off pick up daycare center. A drop off pick up daycare center operated as such versus. A place where you, know, you could, you could, you could. Right. Come on up, just so that we're at the microphone and folks in the public and at home can hear you. Um, all those folks at home. You'd be surprised how many people watch this. Okay, I was instructed by uh, Dave, uh, Derek De La Carte when we talked about what the uses could be, yeah. and one of the things I asked about was the daycare. And he instructed me that to do that, it would have to go out from being special usage of a residence and would be, have to be zoned then either multi-use or commercial and would involve a tremendously long and arduous process and would require tremendous upgrades to the facility which are beyond our budget. And for good reason. And so, Justin, would that be your expectation as well that if that our concern that we don't want this to turn into a drop-in daycare center is addressed because it wouldn't be permissible under this use? Correct, and I, I think that if if there was a drop-off daycare proposed, um, the planning commission would, would have wanted to consider that as part of their decision. So, um, if I could, to be yeah. clear, I mean, is the rabbi suggesting or, or agreeing to your question that he he's not planning on doing a drop-off? Drop I think that's what drop. I heard him say. Because yes. zoning pro prohibits it. Because zoning prohibits that. There was some initial discussions on possibilities for the site and so one of the a question came up about rezoning. Right. Um, right. We directed the applicant to not to not pursue rezoning uh, because it would not be um, it, it just really doesn't make sense for that site. Okay. All right and then follow-up question. We are redoing the master land use plan and the zoning designations are slightly changing. Would that be impacted of future zoning? This uh, the the cha proposed changes to, re or to the zoning district for R1 would not, wouldn't, this would not come yep. up with that. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay. Other questions? Uh, are you finished, Councilwoman? Um, or? Or you can think yes. About uh, one more question. What was the, um, was this um, just purely residential before the dentist office went in, or was there a business use prior to this? No one has ever lived in that facility. That, that, in the last 35 years, it's been strictly a dentist's office. That was, that was my, under my understanding as well in the city's files. The varnish on them from the 1950s and upstairs <laughs> are in pristine condition. Other questions or comments of council? Um, just sort of a, a general comment. I, I hear the concerns of uh, uh, the residents who came up for a public comment. Um, and I think always increased traffic is a concern of almost every resident who is having a different type of use come into a building near their home. Um, but this is uh, right next to our commercial business district um, with an existing parking lot that was designed for a business um, with a historical use of that. Um, so I think that's what the Planning con Commission took into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know a lot of rebunctious church revelers um, and I think the um, issue of capacity I think still needs to be um, confirmed and you said that that would happen if and when if council approves this tonight right so the 32 number is not set in stone um, in dis discussions with the fire marshal there were some um, options talked about about adding some other um, you know, uh, like a, ben a bench um, seating and things like that that would take away from some of the, the seating space in the area. So that would decrease the occup occupancy um, as well. So through the building 
plan process or right, building permit submittal that would all be solidified then um, it could I mean capacity the number of capacity could be a condition that council includes in in the motion okay um, and then just one follow-up question that I saw in the Planning Commission notes from uh, Commissioner asked um, with the 32 cap maximum capacity um, from what the rabbi said would be um, minimally uh, hit over you know every week right um, that's not something that would be regular occurrence um, I think there was uh, a question about special events of wedding natures and, and parties is would that be allowed as well um, I think in discussions with the rabbi it would be very challenging to have an actual wedding there that's larger than the numbers that we've talked about um, the inside of this the facility just wouldn't support it okay those are all the questions I have at this time right I have a question for the rabbi mm -hmm. um, would you humor me in sharing once everything's up and running and going, would you share with me what a typical week at the facility would be like? Uh, what we envision is um, classes on a regular basis. What's what's uh, like? Are you going to have from eight to nine, nine to ten? You, mean, you know, as uh, like we, twelve we like classes we probably a have, day. We probably have like a, <laughs> maybe three or four classes a day, like a before work going to class. Okay. Possibly a lunch and learn if it was that the people in the area were available for such a thing. So a couple of nighttime classes. The garage is going to be used as an art studio. My wife has turned our garage in Oak Park, which is a single uh, car structure, where she teaches small classes, usually uh, five or six, um, where this is a two car garage. It's even bigger than a two car garage. So classes would probably still be five or six because that's a very manageable number for her. So, um, and then we'd probably uh, have people over at our house as welcome as guests as for, for dinners and things like that. Sure. Um, once or twice a week. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other questions, comments, or a motion would be here. Pleasure. Okay. Or were you going to make the motion? I was, I thought, are you about to say something first? I was going to make the motion, but if you want to make the motion, you're <laughs> going to make the Okay. Uh, I move to approve the special land use request for 1725 Pinecrest, Sidwell number 24-25-33-201-032 to permit accessory uses associated with an institution of religious worship with the following findings and conditions as stated in the packet. Is there support? Support. All right, final uh, comments or discussion? I just wanted to say that the final condition is um, the maximum occupancy of the building to be determined by the fire and building department. All right. Okay. So um, that has to be done. Very good. And, and that truly, and through the chair, that truly applies for, for any development that comes through um, that's just in standard protocol all right, all right. I, I I would just like to comment that you know, I, I do understand uh, the concern of, of noise and, and activity as I get older I notice that I'm less tolerant of <laughs> noise earlier in the evening and you know I like my quiet and as people move into my neighborhood I have the conversation with them that <laughs> We are a very quiet neighborhood, and we like to keep it that way. Um, but I, I will be honest: if if the rabbi were to move in, you know, next door to me or across the street from me, I wouldn't have an issue. Um, I don't think that the activity that is going to be happening at that location is um, going to inhibit the quality of life um, in the neighborhood. All right. Barb, would you call the roll, please? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Pollica. Yes. Deanna. Yes. Leakes May. Yes. Mayor Coulter. 
Yes, thank I'm you. Looking for Dan. Oh, yeah, Dan is not with us. Our, our planning yes, commission sure member is not with us this evening, but um, I think the notes captured pretty well what happened at that meeting. So, yes, uh, Rabbi, the uh, special land use is adopted. Thank you, sir. Uh, Justin, you have the next one as well, right? Yes. <clears throat> a public hearing uh, on 21500 Woodward Avenue for a special land use application as well. Yes, as the... Uh, Mayor stated, um, suburban collection is the applicant in this instance for uh, special land use approval. Um, the applicant also operates um, other f auto facilities as part of the suburban Ford complex. Um, for, for clarity purposes, um, the existing pre-owned auto facility is about 1,600 square feet um, at 21500 Woodward Ave. Um, proposed plans are to build a new facility uh, It's about 4,700 square feet. Um, within the existing site, and that was a big question that came up at the Planning Commission is, you know, is this dealership um, or pre-owned auto facility expanding into my neighborhood? Um, so they're staying within that existing site. Um, and they're also providing improvements to the building, um, the design, and um, overall facility, but also landscaping, screening, um, and other improvements there as well. Um, as I mentioned, vehicle dealerships are special land use in the C2 General Commercial District. Um, and at the public hearing, um, the planning or at the planning commission meeting, July 20th, um, a public hearing was held. Um, the residents um, nearby the facility did have some questions about landscaping improvements, some lighting on the site, um, noise, um, and then, as I mentioned, just the um, the chance that the facility would expand into the residential neighborhood. Um, the applicant and planning commission both. Um, I think assured them that expansion was not part of the applicant's current proposal. And, um, and in previous discussions, expanding commercial property near the facility um, and, in, and really in general, um, expanding commercial property into the residential district is not in line with the 2008 master plan, nor is it in line with the proposed uh, 2016 master plan. Um, so with that, the Planning Commission approved the site plan um, with some conditions which the applicant has been working with staff on. Um, it provided a letter of what those condition, um, improvements to the site would be. Um, and so those would be part of the administrative approval um, with staff. Um, some of those changes were additional landscaping and redesigning the display area along Woodward to make it a little more um, friendly to people driving by and some stormwater management. Um, so. A lot of improvements being made to the site. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Planning Commission recommended City Council approval. Staff would recommend that as well based on the application um, and then the conditions that um, will be met through that final um, site plan as well. All right. And so we'll do, a, we'll do a public hearing. Before I do that, I do have sort of a simple clarification question. It was a dealership. It's going to continue to be a dealership. Correct. Why did it require a special land use? Uh, because... Um, Essentially just because it is a brand new building um, on site. Um, so it's in that the district. same special use, but it's a new building, so it, it, triggers. An, it triggers Yes, it triggers a special land use. Wow. Yes. So even though it's currently being used in that, right. that special land use. Right. If they were just <laughs> if they were using the same building and, and providing um, yeah. you know, changes to parking and landscaping, this wouldn't be the case. Okay. So with that, I will open it up for the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address council on this special land use permit? All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and now we'll open it up to council for questions and comments. Uh, my question, you did touch on the subject, but I don't think I got the full answer. Um, lighting, uh, do we have a specific I know I'm going to get the term wrong. Candle power? Foot candles. Yes. On the um, <laughs> of what is allowed and shading and all that. Because when Camborne, when the, when the facility went into Camborne, you could do surgery in their parking lot. It was so freaking bright. Correct. <laughs> and that, and yes, yeah, so our exterior lighting ordinance um, has some specific foot candle uh, measurement requirements. Okay. Um, one of those being that um, only a certain, I think it's 0.4 foot candles cannot, if you were standing in the alley um, next to the facility and ha had a light meter and did the reading, it could not be higher than that. Okay. Um, in the instance of the shops at Camborne, um, 
the lighting that was installed was brighter than expected. Um, <laughs> so so they were we did a light meter reading there um, and had to and they were required to change those lights out as well. Okay. Um, but but yeah yes so um, the part of the discussion on of the site plan that was presented um, the lighting was too bright um, and so that was a condition. Um, since then the applicants remedied that. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Justin, my question was around the what, this stormwater management. What was the discussion around that, and and uh, how is how is the the needs there assessed? Sure. Um, as part of every site plan approval, you're required um, to assess stormwater management. New facilities that are being built have a stricter standard. Um, I believe it's a 10-year storm is the requirement that you have to um, cover for. Um, our engineer um, engineering consultants reviewed that. Um, and so that plan was going to be submitted separately. Um, a lot of times that's just submitted um, as part of the building plan process. So it hasn't been submitted yet? It has not been submitted okay. yet. Okay. So but it would be required to meet all of that. Required and subject mm -hmm. to that. Okay. Absolutely. Obviously we had some flooding in that area particularly, and I know there was at least anecdotally people that thought that there was more waste stormwater generated it, from that property. And, I, I don't, you know. Yeah, and part of that conversation also included that um, you know, maybe there could be some more landscaping added to the property to, to limit some of that um, stormwater runoff. And so um, the, as part of the revision that was submitted, um, the applicant's proposing doing some permeable pavers um, with grass out front under where the, the uh, cars would, would sit. Um, so we thought that was a, you know, a good um, solution that could, could help contribute and also look nice. Okay. Other questions or comments? I'm curious because we've had a lot of conversation about uh, soil in that area, particularly on Hilton. Um, so I'm surprised that this property isn't the same as, you know, hard clay like we have on, um, on Hilton. So it's a different different soil type that can allow for permeable pavers? Uh, I mean, that's what we would have to explore. That would be part of that stormwater. Okay, so that hasn't been determined. Right, We're, okay. right. It is proposed um, at, to use those permeable, permeable pavers if the site will allow for it. Okay. Um, aside from that, there were more landscaping bushes and things like that that also help um, that were added. Okay. But the, actually, the building is twice as big, almost twice as big as the previous building. So right. you're actually taking away from just dead parking. Well, you really don't take away from non-permeable space, though. It's building or parking lot. What's the difference? So, okay, never mind. I, I talked it through myself. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments or questions? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited that uh, this is coming to us because this is a big improvement over what is currently there, and I appreciate the investment on the on the property, and it pretty much falls in line with every other um, uh, dealership on Woodward on the south end, which seems to be you guys are in competition of one another, <laughs> so you're upgrading. Um, so. My, my questions um, about lighting have, I think the Planning Commission has adequately addressed that. I know they're pretty persistent in making sure that lighting doesn't um, impact um, residents as well as sound. Um, the one question I really have is sort of um, in the LSL analysis, um, item specific use requirements, C2, and it talks about vehicle repair within the new building. And it says that um, the type of repair is still underdetermined if they are minor or major. And if it, the Planning Commission determines it as major, they might require the operation be conducted at a remote location, which would indicate that the size of the building wouldn't need to be its size if that operation is located elsewhere. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and issue for the sure. And, uh, if, and uh, the applicant Stanley Takach from Studio Design can help out as well. Um, yeah. But what? it was talked about at the Planning Commission. Um, the in all the discussions, the repair was deemed minor. Um, and what's the difference between minor and major car repair? <laughs> um, I, I believe <laughs> that work? it's more more cosmetic. Okay. Um, they're not going to be doing major, you know, radiator repairs and things like that. Suburban does have other facilities in the area that can service that. They're not going to uh, take out engines and, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So what's council's pleasure? Hang on. Going back up. Um, I move that city council approve the special land use request for uh, 
21500 Woodward Avenue, civil number 24-25-34-430-001 to permit redevelopment of an existing pre-owned vehicle sales facility with the following findings and conditions as listed. Support. All right, moved by Piana, supported by Paulica. Other comments or questions? Um, just that all the residents were notified? Yes, for both the Planning Commission meeting and this notified um, through our box here outside um, for anyone who stops in City Hall on the city's website um, was listed there and then also um, by mail and then in the Daily Tribune. Right. Um, and the alleyway will still be um, accessible to vehicle? Correct. That was one of the, that was one of the fire and, um, um, and police fire concerns, access. yes. Okay. Other than that, I'm really excited. I think the, the pedestrian walkway on the frontage of the property is definitely an improvement. Um, and I think the entryway on Jewel Street um, is definitely going to be beautified with the new landscaping, um, which will be a nice entryway into the neighborhood. I concur with those comments. I'm excited about it. I, I as well. And, and I, you know, I appreciate that Suburban has been a good neighbor uh, to now. They've made some good improvements there and uh, have take care of their property. And so we expect nothing more than or less than that in the future. So we appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Barb, would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Leakes May? Yes. Paulica? Yes. Piano? Yes. Mayor Coulter? Yes. Thank you. That item is adopted. Thank you. I would just like to make a <coughs> passing comment before I leave. Please do, sir. Concerning your previous program on your little furry friends, oh. one of the problems we had when we started this two years ago, this building being of such age, um, the masonry is pretty disintegrated, and they have been living under the building. We've already done the abatement problem, but it got to the point where the salesmen were naming them as they ran in and out underneath <laughs> the building. Well, the second condition of this was the comment of they're always looking for heat. Well, as a porter would deliver a car from the site into the service phase and back, the technician may not be ready to work, he'd be doing, but he'd come back, open the hood, and there'd be three or four little furry friends sitting on the engines <laughs> keeping warm. We have since then done the abatement problem, and hopefully they won't have to use any more CO2 canisters. <laughs> wow. So this will dress it up, I'm sure. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, the next item of business is called the audience. I apologize to any of those of you who are here that want to address council. It took an hour and a half to get here. Uh, but this is your opportunity to address council on any item uh, that that is not on the agenda, because you can speak to that when we get to that portion of the agenda. But is there anyone uh, that would like to address City Council this evening? Come on up, give us your name and address, and three minutes to speak on any issue that you like. All right, I know seeing no one for call to audience, we'll move on to the next item of business, which is our consent agenda. Consent agenda items are agenda items that Council considers routine, and we enact in one motion, unless Council removes something from the consent agenda. Let me read that now. Item A is the approval of the special events permit for the October, October and Barbecue Festival to be held on October 14th, 15th, and 16th of this year as detailed in the Council Action Summary to reflect the consensus of the Special Events Committee contingent upon the enlisted conditions submitted by the Director of Special Events. Item B is the approval of the EPA Oakland County Brownfield Grant Agreement Item C is the approval of the 2016 CN and America in Bloom Grant Agreement. Item D is the approval of the bills and payroll as submitted by the City Manager's Office, subject to review of the Council Finance Committee. What is Council's pleasure on the consent agenda this evening? I move that we accept the consent agenda, agenda as presented. Support. All right. Moved by Leakes May and supported by Pollocka. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, Barb, would you call the room, please? Councilmember Pollica? Yes. Piana? Leakes May? Yes. And Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. The consent agenda is adopted. Moving on now to our only regular agenda item is item A, the consideration of a 2016 signal moderniza modernization program. And who is, is that's going to be you? All right. Good evening, signals. Mr. Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, up for your approval and consideration tonight 
uh, is the 2016 Signal Moder Modernization Program. Um, this project uh, did go through the budget process and was funded uh, for traffic signal upgrades. Um, it was also included as part of the city's CIP process. Um, the project consists of two intersections that will be getting upgrades. Uh, the first one would be the Nine Mile and Allen intersection, and the second one will be the Nine Mile and Pinecrest intersection. Uh, the Nine Mile and Allen, or Nine Mile and Pinecrest intersection, will also uh, have the first um, audible pedestrian crossing signals in, within the city of Ferndale. So. I'm more than willing to answer any questions you may have. All right. Questions of council? Um, just to clarify, there's already arm mass there at Pinecrest and Nine Mile? At Nine Mile and Pinecrest, it is not yeah. currently massed arms. It is a box, it's a span it's the, signal. Okay. Questions, comments, or a motion would be in order. I move to approve the low bid of $367,869.38 of Dan's excavating to perform the 2016 signal modern, modernization program. The expense would be charged to Road Parks Bond, capital account number 350-000-777.700. A lot of numbers. Is there support? Support. All right. Moved by Piana, supported by Leakes May. Further discussion or comments? Barb, would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Pollica? Yes. Piana? Yes. Leakes May? Yes. And Mayor Coulter? Yes, thank you. That item is adopted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, that moot leaves us to call to council. Uh, I see the police chief is here with us this evening. Anything for the good of the community, sir? Nothing this evening, Your Honor. We, we uh, survived the green crew, so we're all set to go. All right. <laughs> How about the fire chief? Chief Sullivan, anything for the good of the community from the fire department? Same here, Your Honor. Same thing. <laughs> all right. Uh, Justin slash Jordan, community economic development, anything else for the good of the community? Sure, just really quickly, just come, on, come on up to you because <laughs> folks at home can't hear you without the mic. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, when they say no, that's all right. But uh, Just very quickly to put on your radar that the uh, master land use plan update is moving forward as scheduled. Uh, we're looking to have that in front of you for potential adoption uh, in your late October meeting, uh, not before several rounds of input with the planning commission, working groups, and of course yourselves uh, being brought in there. But a uh, lengthy document we got from Hamilton Anderson. This is staff review right now, just to put it on your radar. Good. Great. Thanks. Uh, Jenny, anything from HR this evening? See how she comes up here, Jordan? Got to tease the new guy. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Just a quick update uh, regarding our salary survey. Um, we are very excited. We got that data back um, yes. late last week. Um, we're having some initial reviews and some um, uh, conversations about that. We hope to have a presentation to Council um, by the latest, the second uh, meeting in September. Excellent. Very excited to finally see that. Thank you. Um, I see Michael Larry in the audience. Do you want to come up and say anything about uh, Dream Cruise or anything else in regards to special events? Then I actually have a question for you as well. We survived. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple times it rained and, uh, you know, people ran and people came back. Um, I think that uh, overall, I think this was, uh, a, a, you know, a challenge every year because Mother Nature is always in charge, but we always survive. And uh, I just am very grateful and thankful for the wonderful volunteers that we have to help make this happen because without them, it, w it wouldn't be what it is. And of course, with the fire department, the police department, and our DPW, we're awesome. We really are. We're a great city. And I would say you, you did more than survive. You really, it was a Smashing success, uh, despite what Mother Nature threw at you. Uh, great job, very well organized. Um, heard lots of compliments. 
uh, to you and your staff and your volunteers. So great job. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. So last year we had a vendor who was selling Confederate merchandise. Mm -hmm. And we addressed him, and he declined to remove that merchandise. Um, I believe, and I'm looking at the city manager, but that's probably a First Amendment uh, issue, and they probably have a right to do that. Uh, this year we had a vendor that was selling some Confederate merchandise that caused some people uh, uh, to get quite angry. The police were called over because they felt like they were threatened. Um, I stepped in just because I happened to be near there, and I explained to them that why I, we probably couldn't force them to take that merchandise down, uh, that that merchandise was offensive in a community like Ferndale, and if they wanted to be good neighbors and, and vendors in the community, that they probably should. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, it was the same vendor from last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and number two, they did take it down that evening. Uh, by the next day, it was back up. Do you know the vendor I'm referring to? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, I prefer not to invite them back to Ferndale again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's your perception, if that's if that is a violation of any sort of their First Amendment rights. Uh, but my opinion is, twice they've been asked not to insult the community by displaying and, and selling that merchandise, and twice they uh, decided not to follow that suggestion. And what recourse do we have in in using that or any other excuse uh, not to invite them to be vendors next year? Would you agree with that? Do you, uh, do you understand who I'm talking about? Through, through yeah. the chair, I, th yeah. I think that might be an issue where uh, some additional research and a, and a memo to council uh, on okay. possible options okay. going forward uh, and the legal issues associated with that uh, could be provided uh, okay. in a couple of weeks. So that maybe that's more of a question to Dan. Yeah. I might be premature in saying this, but there are going to be some changes for next year. So you, that might not even so be So maybe a, a moot point. Talk exactly. to Dan, okay? <laughs> just talk about that. Okay. I, I, I just was... But I totally agree with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I don't want to, that in any way to reflect on the outstanding work that you, the volunteers, the staff did. It was really well organized. Great Thank job. You. Great job. Okay. Uh, we'll start over since we had the chief already. How about from the finance department? Anything this evening? No. Joe, anything from the... No. Kara, anything from community... Engagement. All right. Anything else from? Back. You're back. <laughs> All right. Happy to have you back. I just wanted to give a couple quick uh, updates on the road projects that Please. we have going on around town. Yeah. Um, Hilton Road from eight mile to nine mile. Uh, they're actually progressing and are a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, they're currently in the process of doing some of the landscape restoration. Uh, <laughs> they'll be milling out, um, you know, the existing asphalt and prepping. So. Uh, they're moving along quite nicely. Uh, traffic, everybody's, you know, with that staging, everybody's in the loop on uh, the traffic control, so everything's been going good there. Um, and then uh, with the 2016 uh, paving program, uh, they're moving along. Uh, actually, by middle to end of this week, they're anticipating having Area 1 done. Um, with the exception of some landscape restoration where they had to remove and replace curb as well as any punch list items. So uh, again, if anybody has any questions or concerns throughout the process, feel free to call the DPW at 248-546-2514. I drive down the first block of Leroy off of Woodward every day to get to my block, and uh, it is a whole other experience. The beautiful job that they did, it is as smooth as you can imagine, and uh, it, so that one went great. Everything I've noticed and observed seems to be on schedule and going well. I haven't yes, had a lot we, of we've ran into or... a couple of, I guess, unknown conditions that weren't shown in the pavement course. It slowed it down. We had to do a little additional work. Okay. Uh, but that did slow it down a little bit, but they're progressing pretty pretty nicely. So. Anybody have comments or questions for him? Uh, the Hilton Project. I know that it was not part of the plan, but... Did you happen to find any trees laying around the DPW yard that you could plant on Hilton? I did not, but I can definitely look into that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. All right, uh, Barb, anything from the clerk's office this evening? This is early, but October 11th is the last day to register to vote for November. Okay, so you can get them online or stop by City Hall and you can pick up an application. Great. When, when can you... Um, request to be a uh, absentee to get an absentee ballot. Now. 
Anytime? We're, we're getting them 75 days ahead of time. Okay. So. so you can do that now if you need an absentee ballot. Excellent. April, anything from the city I else from the city? Do, I have an office. awesome announcement. While we were in our meeting, we have a new addition to our Ferndale family. Jill has delivered Clara James Manchick. So her third little girl and everything went very well. So we <laughs> are happy to have that addition back to our family. That is excellent. Jill is our recreation director yeah. for those of you who don't know, and she was in labor during this meeting and she has given birth. That is great <laughs> news. Great news. <laughs> I don't know if you can top that, but anything else? No, that's not all that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Dan, anything? For uh, just one item. Yeah. The uh, property that the city authorized to sell on Hilton Road, that closing is scheduled for this Wednesday. So uh, there should be money uh, on Thursday back mm -hmm. to the city. Good. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Leeds May. Nothing today. All right. Uh, Councilman Pollock. I have nothing this week. All right. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem Piana. Yeah, just a reminder that the Dales Neighborhood Annual Picnic is um, this Saturday from 1 to 4 at Oppenheim Park. Um, it's potluck, but um, lots of activities for, for kids um, and a great way to get to know your neighbors. So I encourage you to come out. Um, if it's raining, there is a rain date. Um, it's September 10th, and usually uh, rain dates are posted on the Dales Neighborhood Group um, Facebook page. So hopefully it won't rain. Um, and then second, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Captain Palazzolo and um, Officer Amanda Zemanski um, for um, scheduling a uh, police ride along with me. Um, I did that last uh, Saturday or two Saturdays ago and um, basically it's spending four hours in the car and they always say it gets pretty um, busy on Saturday nights from <laughs> 8 to midnight and then I get in the car and nothing happens. Um, not something happens but um, definitely um, a great experience um, and it helps me um, understand what our police department needs um, going forward in terms of equipment purchasing and whatnot. I encourage you to do it if you haven't done it. Well, watch me do it, and it has it be an, a really exciting night that probably terrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> You're in safe hands. I have not done it yet. You are in good hands. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Is that it? Yep. All right. Uh, and I don't have anything further to add. And so with that, our meeting is adjourned.